brothers and sisters, children of all ages, it is time to start the damn party. What do you say? I say, let's do it, shall we? We shall. Let's go for it. Uh, my audio on? My audio is on? We're good. We're golden. The uh, I'm going to pour myself a cocktail in just a minute. Uh, but first, I want to introduce everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Mr. Great Shot, welcome to the party. Uh, I am the old humble guy. Uh, tonight is a uh, whiskey Wednesday night, our whiskey happy hour on the old humble distilling company. Our Wednesday night shows are where science and philosophy meets whiskey. Uh, tonight, we're, I mean, the way I look at it, way, way, way back in the day, you know, uh, classical Greek scientists were as much scientists as they were philosophers. They sat back, they sat in their uh, academy, they sat in their agora. They uh, uh, had a bottle of grappa that they passed around. My my hunches uh, is what they did. They passed around a bottle of grappa. They maybe passed around a bottle of wine. The Greeks loved their wine. They were very good at wine. Um, in fact, they were so good at wine that when the Carthaginians tried to sell their wine overseas, they called it Greek wine and sold it at a premium. Um, so, you know, there's that. Uh, <laughs> um and, you know, they didn't really have uh, empirical evidence of the world around them, uh, other than their casual observations and the rigorous observations in some cases. They didn't have satellites. They didn't have uh, uh, airplanes. They didn't. They, they basically had to sit there and look at things and go, huh. And you know what? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pass around the whiskey. Pour yourself your cocktail. Go ahead and start. It's okay. That was a little bit of water from melted ice. I'm going to start with my award-winning... Double Oak Straight Rye. Award winning. That's right. We won a bronze medal today at the uh, 2022 uh, Texas Whiskey Fest. Uh, one of only three companies, brands, whiskeys, that won a medal in that particular category. One of only three. Uh, so this isn't like the international spirits competitions where, you know, 25 won a gold, 25 won a silver, and then however many won a bronze is uh, whoever else entered. This was a, a, a legit, exclusive, very hard to get award, and I'm very excited that we won one this year. Uh, two years ago, we did not medal at all. When we, three years ago, when we were in 2019, we didn't medal at all, uh, and I was very disappointed because I uh, was really hoping we would medal that year. But this year, we medaled, and I am very, very, very excited that we did. Um, <clears throat> housekeeping stuff. Uh, we'll get on. We'll get into the science and math and all that fantastic stuff in just a minute. Just bear with me. Uh, we will be. Um, I need to double check and see. I need to add. I need to add a scene in here real quick. Uh, while I'm talking, I'll do that. Uh, housekeeping thing to to note: tomorrow night, our trivia night will be early because we're doing it live at the distillery. Uh, and then you know we'll come on and we'll do a happy hour. We'll, we may do the happy hour. During the live show at the distillery, um, maybe, uh, we may do the happy hour, um, we may do the happy hour, uh, uh, on time, you know, after the fact at the, uh, uh, Highland Park 12. That is a very good choice. Uh, that is a very good choice. I am adding in a word from our sponsor, us, the Old Humble Distilling Company, from the Ad Twins. Uh, I may go ahead and just get another Ad Twins ad from those gals. Uh, they did a good job for me the first time, and I'm still using this video. So maybe, maybe we'll have them come in one more time. And, well, not come in one more time, just have them do. Uh, is that the, the big file? Is that the one? I think that's the one. I can't remember if that's the one or not. Uh, anyway, so, um, yep, that's the one. Okay, MP4 file, that's the one. Okay, uh, so, uh, yeah, tomorrow night's trivia may be early. I'm not sure how we're going to do the trivia show. We may not have an actual trivia show. It may just be me and Lisa shooting the shit and enjoying ourselves and having just a chat for them. We'll figure it out. We're going to do it on the fly. We're going to figure it out on the fly. Maybe we'll record it. It's, it's going to be a different type of trivia tomorrow night. Because it's it's pub trivia. We're working. We're doing pub trivia. It's going to be a, a fun little. Uh, I'll show my whiteboard off. Make sure y'all can see that. Uh, don't forget to sub uh, click subscribe. Do all the stuff. 
so that you don't miss any awesome shows. And then, of course, Friday night we've got uh, 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 Friday night we've got Don May live from the distillery. Friday nights live at Old Humble. Uh, music show uh, music starts at seven. The show may start a little bit early. We're just going to have ourselves a grand old time. Turn on the camera, enjoy the show. It's going to be dope as hell, uh, as the kids say. It's going to be lit. Uh, and thank you for the uh, for the for the congratulations. I appreciate that. Uh, it's not just a medal, though. We're in Texas. We don't do medals in Texas. We do belt buckles. So my understanding is, when I go to the uh, Texas Whiskey Festival on May thirteenth, I will get a dinner plate sized belt buckle. I think it's about that big, actually. It's a big fucking belt buckle. A uh, big bronze belt buckle, and I am super duper excited about it. Uh, I'm going to have a whole fresh set of stamps made up for my bottles. It's going to be awesome. So there's that. Housekeeping out of the way. Um, we've been busy at the distillery these last few days. Uh, distilling. Uh, distilling days take 12 hours. Easy. Um, uh, those are 12-hour days. We're doing the... Evenings on Fridays, we're doing, we're, we're running around doing a whole bunch of stuff, getting a whole bunch of stuff done. Tax day was Monday. Uh, yes, taxes are legal. Sorry, libertarians, that's how it is. Uh, I mean, you can say they're not legal. You cannot pay your taxes if you wish, but you are going to suffer consequences because it is legal. Sorry. Um, but there you go. Um, that was Monday, and then uh, you know, all the other stuff that's going on. I've got to make a trip down to Laredo to pick up bottles. Uh, I've had family in over Easter. Uh, we've just had, it's just been, things are picking up. Things are getting busy. Uh, the streaming schedule may be lightening up a little bit. I may be just doing two or three shows a week instead of five. Holy shit. That was a lot of shows. Uh, but we are still on our quest for a hundred thousand views. Uh, and that next episode of the hundred thousand views will probably be in the beginning of May. So, I'm doing this because my my boom is right here in front of me, and I don't want to like I'm, I'm talking with my damn hands. I'm probably not talking with my left hand, but I'm right-handed, so I talk with my right hand, and I can't sit over here because I mean, I, the sign's just gonna have to get covered up with my back. Maybe I can move it. Where can I move this to? Put it up here. Cover up some of this mess. All right, here. Left. Does that work? <laughs> Yeah, that works. Okay, that's where it'll go from now on. All right. So don't forget, subscribe today, hit the notification bell, like the video, do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Look, see, I'm a YouTuber too. I can ask people to do that. But let's not waste any more time than we have to. Uh, where are we at? 15 minutes in? This is good. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a word from our sponsor, which is me. Um, <laughs> and that'll give me my cue to cut this video. Because from this point forward, I'm actually going to edit this video into another video, which we can upload as like a 17 or 20 minute short, shorter video. Uh, and then once I'm done with the topic, which is Euclid's five postulates, which sounds dry and sounds super dull, but I'm telling you, this shit is awesome. Like uh, these, these old Greek dudes were literally sitting around going like, what is a line? What do we consider a line to be? And then, like, the next dude was like, well, maybe a line is something that just... Uh, yeah. And then Euclid was like, this shit's obvious, guys. It's a, it's between two points. Vanessa Kitty, this one's for you. Uh, it's well, we'll get into it in a minute. Anyway, so the Ad Twins are going to come on. A word from our sponsor. We'll have two words from our sponsor. Uh, this video, or and then I'll cut it. And we'll be able to upload it into a shorter bite-sized video. Because I want to try something where we, where we take a piece of this show, upload it into a video onto the channel, and then steer people towards the live chats uh, to kind of see how that goes. Uh, I, I, I want to try and do something a little bit. I want to, I want to do a little experiment. And you'll notice on the, today's show that the thumbnail looked different. I'm doing a little experiment. I'm also going to take this little clip of the meat of the show and upload it and see how that works because the late night 10 p.m. live chat thing is different than the thing that people would otherwise get fed through the algorithm on a daily basis. So I want to see if the, the uploaded bit gets any... I'll talk about this next month when we talk about the 100,000 views. Uh, anyway. Euclid's postulates. That's right, Vanessa. This one is... It is a... 
a long distance dedication to Vanessa Kitty, Euclid's Postulates, coming to you live from Humble, Texas. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you in part by Angry Jack's Barbecue Joint. Angry Jack's Barbecue Joint on Loretta and Wall. Angry Jack's. What the fuck are you looking at? Just order a sandwich. Angry Jack's, the best barbecue that you'll get cussed out about. And also, our video is brought to you in part by the Old Humble Distilling Company's award-winning double oak rye, not mentioned in the video that I'm about to play. Is your bar looking a little ordinary? Is it lacking something awesome? Well, head out to local liquor store and, and pick, pick up, up something, something extraordinary. extraordinary. Old Humble Straight Whiskey or Old Humble. You know what I didn't do? I didn't size that properly because I can't size it properly because transform, where's the button for transforming it? Because I can't see it. I can't, couldn't see the damn thing. Um, here it is, add twins, add. Filters, transform. So you see, this is the part that's gonna get edited out. Uh, bit to screen, there we go. Now a word from our sponsor. Is your bar looking a little ordinary? Is it lacking something awesome? Well, head out to your local liquor store and pick up something extraordinary. Grab a bottle of Old Humble Straight Whiskey or Old Humble Special Reserve. They're clean, smooth, easy drinking whiskeys that taste the way whiskey should taste. Humble beginnings to an extraordinary finish. Old Humble whiskeys are what your bar needs today. Day. Walk tall, be awesome, and, and drink, drink Umble. Old Umble Straight Whiskey and Old Umble Special Reserve. Get, get yours today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, children of all ages, let's get into it, shall we? Euclid's Five Postulates. Before we get into the Five Postulates, let's talk a little bit about Euclid himself. Euclid was this cat who lived back in, uh, he was born around 330 BC, uh, 330 years before Christ BC, before the Common Era, if you will. Uh, he was a contemporary, briefly, with Aristotle when he was a child, and uh, Archimedes when he was older. So, like, these people, like Archimedes, the Eureka, like, these are real people. There's not just the name of an owl in Disney's uh, Sword of the Stone. These are real people who actually lived lives way back when. Um, we know Aristotle, he's a big brain dude. Then, of course, there's this dude, Euclid, and then towards the end, uh, but he was also a contemporary with um, another, I didn't bring my damn notebook in here. I wrote all this stuff down. I, didn't, I, I write all this shit down. I do my studying. I do my research. And I don't bring my notebook into the, in the, into the uh, uh, studio. Anyway, uh, on, in the later years of his life, he was also a contemporary with uh, not just Archimedes, but Erastenes. Erastenes being the guy who confirmed the roundness, the spherical nature of the earth using the stakes uh, in the ground and the, the shadow that was cast. Um, <clears throat> big brain dude, super smart. Uh, all these dudes were big brain dudes and super smart. They practiced thinking and practiced thinking about the world around them and the shape of the world around them and the nature of the world around them. Uh, and and Euclid comes up with these five postulates. A postulate is literally just saying that it goes without saying. These things are self-evident. They go without saying. They're the basis for a fundamental rationale for reasoning. And that's why these things are important. Because people complain and they cry and they moan and groan that kids aren't taught critical thinking skills. Kids aren't taught uh, logic and critical thinking. But like literally, that's what geometry is. Euclid's postulates, the principles, uh, the elements, all of this stuff is basic logic, basic critical thinking, basic, just the basic ability to be able to put A plus B together and get C. And A plus B will always be C. And if A plus B is always C, then C minus B is always A. That's how things work. And it's basic logic. And uh, when I was younger, at least, uh, when we went through geometry, you had to prove, you had to go through the logical proofs of, you know, if the side and side and angle are the same, then what does that tell you about the rest of the stuff? And Euclid's, all of that stuff is based on Euclid's uh, five 
basic postulates. All of this stuff, all of this stuff is feeds from these basic things. And, and it's like this stuff existed before Euclid put it on paper, but <clears throat> there were a bunch of loose principles and things that people understood to be true. But Euclid put put pen to paper, quill to papyrus or whatever uh, the Greeks used, put pen to paper and actually actually proved what everybody knew to be true was actually true. Um, and that goes a long ways to saying uh, common sense isn't always common and it's not always sense because a lot of times what people know to be true, like, you know, space is made of ether or uh, the basic elements of life of, of the universe around us is earth, wind, and fire. You know, basic stuff like that is common sense, but not true. But Euclid's postulates were common sense knowledge, and he put them to paper and confirmed them to be true. And this is what's so important about what Euclid did. So, without any further ado, let's get into what the actual postulates were. Now, these postulates all show up in his first book, uh, the first book of his series called The Elements. It was 13 books, 13 chapters, however you want to describe it. Um, called The Elements. Uh, the most printed, most read, most used book in the history of mankind, even more printed and more used than that other book that uh, Gutenberg printed first, the Bible. Uh, Euclid's Elements were translated in all, they inspired uh, scientists through the ages, including, but not limited to, Copernicus, Galileo, um, uh, Copernicus, Galileo, Einstein, Maxwell, Gold. It, it inspired a whole host of people. And Einstein is one of those keys, uh, uh, key scientists that it inspired. And I'll get to that later, you know, especially with his fifth postulate, which is the most absolutely most controversial of them all, and I'll explain why in a moment. So, let's start with, uh, let's call my graphics department in here, postulate number one. Oh, it's right down there at the bottom. Postulate number one. Uh, a line segment can be extended. Nope, that's not postulate number one. That's postulate number two. Where is postulate number one? Here we go. Cut, get rid of those. Postulate number one is a line can be drawn between any two points. This literally is the definition of a line. Any two points. Um, you have two points, you can draw a line in between those two points. This is basically saying what everybody knows to be true, that um, the straightest, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Uh, that line is a straight line. It is. Uh, it doesn't curve. It doesn't bend. If you have two points, uh, it, it, it's. There are certain properties to that line. It's 180 degrees. Uh, two points make the line. If you have two other points and those lines intersect, then they're. You know they're. they They either are parallel or they're not parallel. You draw a line in between the line. Like this whole structure of being comes from the basic understanding and basic principle, the basic knowledge that. Between any two points, you draw a line. Not particularly controversial, not a whole lot to talk about, not a whole lot to go into regarding this. Um, we'll just leave it as it is. We'll, we'll leave it there, and, but we'll go to the next one. The next one is an extension, literally an extension of this first postulate, uh, because the second postulate says a line segment can be extended indefinitely. I can't tell you how earth-shattering this concept is. Indefinitely means, literally, a line can be extended. You start with these two points, a very finite thing. Two points. And then you can take this point and extend it forever. That line goes, and it becomes the same line forever. Its properties do not change infinitely. It goes from here to forever, and it continues to be that line. Whatever the properties of this line are here, it continues to go that way. It's predictable. Whatever its slope is, it continues there. Whatever its slope is this way, it continues on that slope. At this point, this point, this point, any point along that line shares the same properties 
the same slope, the same properties, the same, just all the way down, infinitely. This is extremely important because that means that line is not going to bend back. It's not going to deviate off to the side. It's not going to go up. It's not going to go down. And if you have two lines side by side, they both extend infinitely if they, if they are not, uh, well, we'll talk about the parallel lines in a second, but that we'll, we'll talk about just this one line, this particular postulate right here, that line phew, extends permanently, infinitely, forever. And it goes in both directions and it doesn't turn. It doesn't twist. It doesn't bend. It doesn't do anything other than be a line forever. That is, it's huge. Because, I mean, you think about who these people are and what these people are doing. They're sitting around an academy uh, pavilion, passing their wine back and forth, having their sips, talking about this stuff. They have a concept of the infinite already in 300 BC. They have a concept. This is prior to, this is prior to even the concept of zero. The number zero hasn't been invented yet, but they have a concept of infinity. Huge. Amazing that they, they, that they can sit around and come up with this shit. Stuff. Sorry, kids. Um, so postulate three comes from, in part, postulates one and two. Postulate three says, a circle can be drawn with any center and any radius. Old humble guy. Duh. Yeah, duh. I get it. Yeah. A circle can be drawn with any. Let me explain to you why this matters. If you take a piece of paper, you have a dot, and you draw a circle. That circle has specific properties. It has a center, it has a radius, it has a diameter, it has a circumference. The circumference divided by the diameter is always 3.14, etc., etc., etc. The Greeks knew this they knew it was within a certain they knew it was between 3.13 and 3.16 they knew uh, they had a pretty good idea <clears throat> they knew that these circles all had the same property this was an intuitive thing we knew this but if you take that circle and blow it up bigger bigger even bigger than that bigger than that bigger than that Bigger than that. Yeah, keep going. Make it bigger. Keep making it bigger. Keep making it bigger. Yeah. The bigger you make the circle, nothing changes. The radius could literally be infinite. And the circle would have the same properties as the circle that's only one inch big. This was the building block upon which Erasthenes determined the circumference of the earth a couple hundred years later. Not, well, it wasn't a couple hundred years, like only 50 years later, like three, 330, 280, 310, somewhere in that neighborhood. This was a huge realization. Well, uh, uh, it wasn't a realization. It was a real, uh, a real codification of things that they already knew to be true. They knew this to be true, but Euclid put it on paper, confirmed it, codified it, proved it, with logic and numbers and, and, and a logical proof to say that the dimensions of the circle are the same no matter how big you make the circle or how small you make the circle. A circle on paper is the same as a circle around the city, is the same as the circle around the planet, is the same as the circle around other planets, is the same circle. All the circles are the same circles. And this was a building block on which later minds came to confirm the size of the earth. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Um, the, be the beginnings of propositional, uh, of positional notation is very important. Yes, it's very important. Thank you, Vanessa Kitty. Uh, the beginnings of these notations are extremely important as well. And that is another thing that Euclid established was like the, the notation behind all this. So that, so that everybody could agree on how points are described and lines are described and all that stuff. But even more so, not only do people agree on how it's described, 
but they, they, they can understand and see on paper and share this knowledge um, that all this stuff is the same. And that's all that I'll, I'll get to that, this point, I'll, I'll reinforce this point in a moment that having it written down, having it in book form, being able to share this knowledge was huge, absolutely huge. Because when you have it written down and you can share the knowledge, it transcends civilization, it transcends knowledge, uh, uh, transcends lifespans, it transcends language, it transcends time and space, and you are literally influencing knowledge for generations to come. But we'll get back to that in a minute. I may not have to. Um, the fourth postulate. Now, once we've got a line, segment, we've got an infinite line, we have a... Um, we have a circle, line segment, infinite line, circle. This one is another one that you read it and you go, duh. You're supposed to read it and go, duh, because it's a postulate that literally says what we already know. But again, puts it to paper, and this is why it's important. All right angles are equal. All right angles are equal. We know right angles are equal, old humble guy. Duh. Right. Yeah, right angles. They're 90 degrees. They're supposed to be equal. But here's why this matters. Remember, a circle, a small circle, and a big circle are the same. They're congruent. The word's congruent. They're the same. They're the same dimensions. They're just, uh, they're the same proportions. They're just larger dimensions. Right angles, small right angles, on paper, and big right angles, like between Earth and the Moon and the Sun. These right angles are also congruent. They're, they're the same. They're 90 degrees. They're big L. Um, but that also means that if you have the, uh, the leg of a triangle and the height of a triangle and the hypotenuse of a triangle, if the leg and the right angle and the other leg are the same, then that means that the other triangle, you, if you have a small one and a big one, that those triangles are also congruent, which means their angles are the same. You see where I'm getting? See where I'm going with this? See where I'm going with this? That means you can draw something on a piece of paper, measure the angles, and then look at a building and say, well, those angles are the same because the dimensions are the same. So, and, and this is, again, the basic principles on which geometry is established. How we organize our entire universe, how we organize our entire world. You can literally take on a piece of paper, a piece of paper or your, your palm, and you can draw a triangle and you can look at that and you can look at another triangle. Oh, yeah, these are the same because the sides, the, the dimensions are the same. The, 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 the angles are proportional. That right angle for the small triangle and the right angle for the big triangle are the same also with squares and if you cut that angle in half that 45 degree angle is the same as every other 45 degree angle uh, you cut it in half again and you have 22 and a half 22 and a half is the same as every other 22 and a half degree angle the greeks didn't have these numbers yet they just knew right angles right angles were special for greeks uh, because of squares and triangles and all this stuff pythagoras was well before, uh, I think about 100 years before Euclid. Euclid pulled Pythagoras's information and pulled it into this postulate and because Pythagoras already understood the power of a right triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. We'll talk about Pythagoras another day, where philosophy and science meet whiskey on a Wednesday night. Um, but the ability to sit back and discuss with people and say, you know, things that are small models can be blown up to scale, and these angles are the same, was a huge, not just a revelation, We they because they knew these things to be true. This was, again, codifying this information on paper, codifying it on paper, uh, codifying the notations, standardizing the language around it, and proving it to be true, the common knowledge to be true, for like the first time. Like things that people had known for a hundred years already and had been passed down verbally 
has now been written down, put into a book, and can be handed to other people where you don't have to have them physically present to teach them. You can take this knowledge and literally spread it through time and space, which is a huge revelation. Huge revelation. Transforms knowledge for centuries to come. Euclid was able to reach out and inspire Copernicus and Galileo and Einstein. Because he wrote this shit down. And. This is also really, really cool. This was another piece. Of the puzzle. That Erasthenes used. To confirm the earth was round. <laughs> just a couple of decades later. Right? Because he had the, uh, the, the, the stake in the ground. And the angle of the triangle. The, the 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 length of the triangle down here, the length of the triangle up here, the hypotenuse of the triangle, figured out the angles. And because the the triangles were different, you know, 500 miles apart, the triangles were different, he was able to go, oh, obviously, duh, he figured this, figured this stuff out. Pretty simple, just with casual observations of the world around him. But here's where it gets weird. These first four were all very much, duh, right? Old humble guy, duh, of course a line's a line. It goes forever. You put it in between two points. The straightest point between two, or straightest distance, or shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Duh, everybody knows this. Yeah, everybody knows this. But there was a point in time where everybody knew it, but couldn't really explain it. And this was the first time, around 350 BC, when it was first fully explained and written down demonstrated. We learned this stuff, I learned this stuff, and I believe it was um, eighth or ninth grade. I think it was ninth grade when, when I took geometry. Way, way, way back when I was just a young lad, 14 years old, studying at the feet of Plato, or it wouldn't, been, wouldn't have been Plato, it would have been uh, Aristophanes, I suppose, because I wouldn't have studied at the feet of Euclid himself. Anyway, doesn't matter. They were all old dudes. Um, so what we did you know, you'd have to prove all this stuff. You have parallel lines, a line that goes between them. You know, determine the the angle of this given that this given this angle was 80 degrees. Determine what the uh, angle of C is and whether or not these lines are parallel or intersecting lines. That was basically what we had to do, and you'd have to write out the proof. Given that, da da da, da and you put all your facts out. Given, 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 and then da, da, logic it out without actually putting down a protractor and figuring this out. But here's where it gets weird. Euclid's fifth postulate. This is the this is the one like everybody said the first four they were they you know he's talking about it in the agora whatever everybody's like yeah okay that all uh, that all makes sense. But when it came to the fifth one this is where things got weird and and I'll tell you why things get weird. So he says Given a line K and a point P, not on line K, there exists one and only one line M through P that is parallel to K. Well, that's just gibberish. It's kind of Greek to me. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, literally, it's kind of Greek. This is what it looks like. Given a line, there's Another, there's a point through that point. There, where is it at? Given a line, there's a point through that line that is where that line is parallel. This is what this means. That line in between them, that is the that's the line that kind of connects the two of them. It's not really necessary. I didn't really look at that graphic before I downloaded it. <laughs> so. This postulate says that P, that, that, that line M through P is parallel. Line K is a point through P. Uh, I'm sorry, line K exists and line M goes through P that is parallel to K. And those two are forever parallel, forever and ever, as long as you go forever and ever, amen. And there's only one line. 
And that one line is always parallel and it goes forever, both directions, parallel. This is where it gets controversial. You ready? You ready for the controversial nature of this? This doesn't work everywhere, all the time, forever and ever. Amen. The other four postulates work always and forever. Amen. Always. Always and forever. This one, number five, doesn't. Because, and this is where you talk about non-Euclidean geometry, this works specifically on a flat plane that goes flat forever. As long as that plane doesn't bend, move, shift, twist, dip, bump, hump, whatever. As long as that's true, this is true. Euclidean geometry. This works on a flat plane. Draw out a piece of paper, draw a line, draw a dot, and through that dot, there's only one other line. It will never, ever, 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 ever intersect. Take a basketball. You've seen the lines on a basketball, right? There's a horizontal, not a basketball. Yeah, basketball is a good one. There's the, the threads on a basketball. The lines go horizontal or vertical. Then the line next to it is vertical. The line next to it is vertical. They all cross at the pole, at the top pole. But you could also take those same lines, turn it on its side, and have those lines go around the circumference of the ball. Like latitude lines on a globe, you know? Equator, 15 degrees up. Tropic of Cancer, 15 degrees up above that. About where Houston is, 15 degrees up above that. 15 degrees, until eventually you get 90 degrees up and you're at the pole. Right? But if you turn those, rotate them 90 degrees, you have the meridians, the longitude lines. They go up and through the poles, and they all intersect. So if you have two lines, if you have a line, let's call it E, the equator, and you have another line, uh, just 15 degrees above the equator, or let's go 15 degrees off the meridian. Let's start at the meridian, you go 15 degrees off the meridian. You have literally two lines that are both parallel and intersect. And they are, even the parallel line intersects because it's a globe. And the globe, and, and you draw a line in between those two lines, you get 90 degrees in between both of them, which says it's supposed to be, you have equal, equal angles, making those lines parallel, but because the globe actually bends, those lines cross at the top. The lines are both parallel and intersect because of the plane that the lines are on. And that's why this postulate right here was so different. He, he, this was the last postulate. This was the one he agonized over and thought about, 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 before he finally put it on paper, with the caveat that this only works on a flat plane. And this is one of the ways that it inspired Einstein several hundred years later, uh, actually a couple thousand years later, because it went from the 300s to the 1900s, which would have been 2,200 years later. Einstein looks at our flat, our notion of a galaxy or of a, uh, well, of our galactic plane and our universal plane that's expanding out. And he looks at it and he says, well, what if space and time aren't actually flat and expanding infinitely into the future? What if space and time are actually a dimension of the universe and it bends? What if the plane of our universe bends with gravity and light traveling on that plane bends with the gravity? Then you have parallel lines coming from a star, parallel lines of light coming from the star that actually bend on the plane of the universe. 
because of gravity, because gravity is this big well and it 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 makes pits and bends and and divots in the 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 universal fabric. And we should be able to see evidence of that, right? And it just so happens that we do get to see evidence of that because during an eclipse, you can actually observe stars that are supposed to be behind our sun lensed off to the side because gravity, what the gravity of the sun actually moves the light of the star and we see the star over here off to the side instead of being blocked out by the sun. Euclidean geometry that works on paper, that works all over the place, except for when it doesn't. The non-Euclidean geometry of our universe. This helps to determine and define and codify and explain all of this stuff that we see. And it is so cool. This is the weird one. This is the one that is both true and untrue and works on a plane until you get in like the sphere, the spherical globes that we live on, non-Euclidean geometry. You can actually have like the 90, the, the, the fourth postulate that says 90, all 90 degree angles are the same. All 90 degree angles equal each other. Where's that at? Right there. All right angles are equal. All right angles are equal. And if you take the square on the globe or a triangle on the globe, actually, you can take a triangle on a globe. You have 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and 90 degrees on a globe, which only works. It only, All three of those angles are 90 degrees, and that only works on a globe. You can't do that anywhere else. You can't do that on paper. You can only do that on a globe or on a plane that has been bent and shifted using gravity wells or hyper-dense hyper objects that physically bend the structure of our universe as we move through it, which is just absolute fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Because of this, now there's further details and data that go into the proof on this. And it has to do with uh, uh, lines. And if you draw a line in between them and the angles are less than the, the sum of the angles where the lines intersect, the interior, the ins, hang on, let me, let me re-explain this. You have two parallel lines, or you have two lines, and you intersect those lines with a third line. If the sum of the interior angles are less than 180 degrees, then you have intersection on that side. If the sum of the interior angles are greater than 180 degrees, then the lines will deviate forever. If the sum of the angles in between are 180 degrees, then they are parallel, which is what this line in the middle explains on these two guys here. The sum of those interior, of, let's do this, the sum of these interior uh, angles is 180 degrees. Those lines do not intersect. But if this here was drawn on a round globe, do that. Hang on. Where? Hold on. There. Hang on. How can I do this? How can I do this where I'm not covering my face up? That. 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 <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'm going to move it over here. Whoop. There it goes. If the sum of these angles. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the sum of those angles are less than 180 degrees. Those angles will intersect, or those lines will intersect. If the sum of those angles are greater than 180 degrees, those lines will deviate. If those sum, the sum of those angles equal 180 degrees, they are parallel. And they're parallel forever, going out forever, and parallel forever, going out forever. Unless you're on a globe. Then this geometry doesn't work. This geometry does not work if it's not on a flat plane. If it's on a globe, a sphere, uh, a pyramid, a square, um, or a cube. Well, a cube would be four, uh, six flat planes. Uh, there's only one other shape, really. I mean, you're, it's either a flat plane, a series of flat planes, 
or a round surface. I mean, there's no there's no real other there's no other real shapes that work in with non-Euclidean geometry. There's really only two: flat plane or round surface. And on a round surface, you can see on a round a round surface you can see where those lines are both parallel. But if you draw them out, draw them out to the pole where they intersect, and then they go back across. And then right at the uh, equator, they'll be parallel again. And they go back to all the way down to the South Pole. They pinch off again. Uh, Vanessa, you are lighting me up. What are you saying? Uh, a triangle and a spherical geometry is the sum of the angles of triangle are greater than 180 degrees. They can all three be angles. Yes, that is 100% true. Uh, we see this all the time. Uh, in fact, we see it on our own globe from the equator out 90 degrees, and then where you have, you go out 90 degrees from the equator and you go down to the South Pole, you can literally go, take a hard right, hard left turn, go south to the pole, take a hard right turn, go back up to the equator, and then take a hard right turn and go back to uh, where you started. Or you can go straight south, end up at the pole, turn 90 degrees, go straight north, and end up at the pole, and then turn 90 degrees and go straight south, back to the pole. Um, in fact, the only place on Earth where you can turn west, uh, and you can, you can turn, the only place on Earth where you can't go west is either at the North or South Pole. Everywhere else you can go west. Uh, and that works on a globe. This, this only works on a flat plane. And that's why this postulate was such a this postulate was such a uh, contentious uh, and controversial postulate, and you know some people for a long, 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 long time, four postulates of Euclid were taught, not five, but five are what are actually taught, uh, and that uh, that's the five postulates. That's that's Euclid's five postulates. All right, well, let's start at the beginning. We'll recap it from the start. Jump. Uh, a straight line can be drawn between any two points. The shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. A straight line can be drawn between any two points. That straight line can be extended infinitely, and it will continue to be the same straight line. You see how all of these things build? One builds on itself, builds on itself, build, uh, builds on the next, builds on the next, builds on the next, or the next builds on the first, and the next one builds on the second, and the fourth builds on the third, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, until you get to this last one, which is literally earth shattering. Um, a circle can be drawn with any center and any radius, which the definition, because the definition of a circle is uh, point, radius, circumference, uh, uh, and all the dimensions are congruent, uh, no matter how big it is or how small it is. Uh, and all right angles are equal. 90 degrees is 90 degrees, whether you're on a flat plane or a round globe. 90 degrees is 90 degrees. And the fourth and final, or the fifth and final, the controversial one, given a line K and a point P, not on line K, there exists one and only one line, M through P, that is parallel to K. Unless you're on a globe. And then that parallel line is not parallel forever. <laughs> but he didn't add that to the postulate. That was, that's a, that's a, uh, an addition to the postulate. It's, that's actually in the proof. That's how you prove that the plane is flat. That's how you prove the geometry that you're working on. If the, if the lines never intersect, then you're working on a flat plane. If the lines do intersect, you're not working on a flat plane. Because the only way parallel lines intersect is when you're not on a flat plane. Basic general observations of the world around. Um, and with that, we're going to kick it to a word for our sponsors, and I will be back momentarily. 
Is your bar looking a little ordinary? Is it lacking something awesome? Well, head out to your local liquor store and, and pick, pick up, up something, something extraordinary. extraordinary. Grab a bottle of Old Umble Straight Whiskey or Old Umble Special Reserve. They're clean, smooth, easy drinking whiskeys that taste the way whiskey should taste. From humble beginnings to an extraordinary finish, Old Umble Whiskeys are what your bar needs today. Walk tall, be awesome, and, and drink humble. Old Umble Straight Whiskey and Old Umble special reserve. Get yours today. And you're right, Vanessa. Welcome back to the show. You're right, Vanessa. I did leave off hyperbolic uh, geometry because hyperbolic geometry is, uh, well, I was, I was thinking mostly the surface. You're right. Hyperbo hyperbolic geometry on a hyperbola. That is a very, uh, that's, a, that's a different monkey uh, in and of itself as well. I uh, hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed the deep dive. It's been a long time since I've dug into uh, the Euclidean uh, stuff. We're going to do more. I'm going to do more stuff like this. Uh, if it's worth listening to, if you like it, if you think it's interesting, give me a thumbs up, give me a like, give me a share, do all the stuff. Uh, I want to do more of the uh, old Greek philosophers, the basic critical logical thinking. I want to do more of the Greek philosopher, maybe do a deep dive into how uh, the Pythagorean theorem works. We'll do a deep dive into... Uh, Actually, it's still called the Pythagorean theorem. It's not, even though it's like confirmed law at this point. Um, I want to do a deep dive in this stuff. Maybe I'll work my way up from Pythagoras through Plato and Aristotle and, and Socrates. I like the Socratic method of question and answer and, 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 and working your way through problems and solutions. I, I find that to be just uh, um, very, very, very fun and fascinating. And I find all this to be uh, just maddeningly interesting and fun to do. Let's make that a little bigger. Yeah, we did. Good. Um, so let's roll up. Great shots out. See you, great shot. Stick and sand makes a wonderful blackboard. Yes, it does. Uh, beaches. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing the show from the beach. Uh, I, I don't want to bring my... My computer's already struggling to exist. Um, the sphere of something nifty, yes. Uh, where your typical triangle equals 180 degrees. Angles on a triangle on a sphere equal much more than 180 degrees. And square. And circles do, or spheres do, all kinds of weird stuff uh, to the geometry of objects as we know them. Um, they are, they, they do all kinds of, of, of weird magical things. Uh, what ifs for the fifth postulate? Uh, you were banned in the ninth grade from talking calculus that you were supposed to do. Uh, shame on you, talking calculus. That's subversive. Don't talk calculus in the ninth grade. Shame, shame. Um, the axiomatic method. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, that is, that is, yeah, that was, uh, I, I, I did, I left that out. I didn't find that to be, uh, uh, important, <laughs> but that was, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the postulates and, uh, the, the logical process of walking your way through the proofs, uh, of, of, I found it, I found it to be maddening because a lot of, uh, a lot of the proofs that we were doing, a lot of the you know, we we were basically writing down things. How do I describe this? Well, we were basically writing it down, uh, uh, confirming things that we already knew, which was frustrating to me for several reasons. Because it was you know, you you were literally going through a process of showing your work. Um. You know, like uh, long division or or long mat or uh, long multiplication problems where, you know, you had to show your work when you could just look at it and go, oh, it's 125, write down 125, but you were supposed to actually do all the work in between. The proofs process was literally doing all the work in between where you look at this angle and you look at this angle and you look at this angle and you go, okay, well, those are equal and those are equal, done, and you just write it down. You couldn't do that. They, they, the, this section of the class was frustrating to me because you had to start with, given that, a equals B, and then write down the next logical step and then explain why you're taking that logical step. 
and then write down, and then given that that's true, then this is true because, and then you, you get all the way to the end of your proof, and it was frustrating to me. It's like giving instructions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know, um, you know, go to the go to the pantry, open the door, grab the bread, open the bread, take out the bread, put the bread on the plate, close the bag, seal the bag, bring it back to the pantry. And then like you get points off because you where's the plate coming from? And you're like, oh Jesus. All right, go to the pantry, get the bread, <laughs> open the bread, get the plates, put the bread on the plate. You know, you, you you have to go through this systematic process, and it there was nothing intuitive allowed in the proofing process. There's nothing intuitive allowed. Your your uh, system, your procedure had to be very very granular down to the basic basic level, and that was very frustrating to me because I was very much a big picture kid not a details kid, very much like I am now where I'm a big picture guy and not a detail guy. Um, <laughs> write the instruction in the machine language. We actually had that uh, conversation here at my house uh, not a, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago, uh, where my kid was talking about um, uh, uh, automation, uh, automated cars. Uh, AI cars. My older my older kid did a project on it when he was in high school or, or late middle school or something like that where they did a little robotics thing and my little one's doing the same thing. My younger kid's doing the same thing. <clears throat> and, you know, we, we always talk about this. Well, when this comes up, we talk about this, how, you know, most of a trip is really easy when you're when you're doing instructions on how to get from Houston to New York. Most of the trip is uh, like I, I forty or uh, Highway fifty nine to twenty twenty to ninety five ninety five to New York, you're done, right? The hard part of the trip is when you get to New York. What do you do next? Because you have to get to the hotel, and you have to get off the freeway, and you have to go to the road, and you have to make a turn, 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 you have to make a turn. Oh yeah, there's stop signs along the way. There's stop lights along the way. So you have to stop. You have to stop. 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 Get to the parking garage. Go up the parking garage. Do all this stuff. There's like a whole shit ton of instructions in the last mile of code that has to be put into that. When you put into robotics language, like most of it's easy. Go west for. 600 miles to point yourself west and go west for 600 miles but then it's exit number 432 loop back under the freeway take a right turn on uh uh west haven uh stop at the stoplight go when it turns green turn left at the next uh intersection go behind the denny's and there's your hotel that's uh, that's a that's a whole lot more complicated to teach a, a a car to do that, especially considering in that last two miles there's a bunch of people on the sidewalk that are wandering around looking like morons. This idiot over here in the right hand lane who decides he needs to turn left and he cuts across traffic and you got to freak out because you're a robot and you weren't expecting that to happen, so you just crashed into somebody. Um, yeah, machine language is much harder than a uh, real life language. Uh, have, you, have I done program? I have not done. I have not physically done it. I've, uh, I've seen it. I've read about it. I understand. I, I understand the challenges, but I've not ever done it myself. Um, I'm, I'm. Well, no, I take that back. I did that back when I was a kid. When we did, uh, it was part of our logic classes. Part of our classes of. Uh, in geometry, when you had to instruct a program to build a square, and then, uh, in fact, this was part of that same conversation. It was a it was a geometry program, a drawing program, where you had a little cursor, a turtle, in the middle of the screen. I think it was called Logo. The program was called Logo. You had a turtle in the middle of the screen. Then you told the turtle, go forward sixty. You know, it's forward sixty. 90 degrees, forward 60, 90 degrees, forward 60, 90 degrees, forward 60, 90 degrees, and that was your square. And then you would tell it to turn 
15 degrees. And then you you program in square. So you'd run function square, turn 15, run function square, turn 15, run function. And then you'd have a little mosaic of a, a, a square, a flower, as it rotates around and draws the squares. And then you'd add in a couple of things. And it was it was a cool little program, very rudimentary back in the day. Um, but the same basic machine learning type of thing much more advanced today than they were back then um but you know this was back in the era when uh color monitors were green and black instead of black and white uh <laughs> apple two c's apple two e's uh commodore 64s it was a whole different world uh, Four by four by four Rubik's cube in machine language on the Commodore 64. Yeah, list logo language. You remember logo? Uh, that was a that was a shit. Uh, I learned how to code in BASIC. BASIC was the first and only computer language that I learned. Uh, and <clears throat> what what bothers me today, I guess, is that they they don't teach the basic logic of they don't it doesn't seem like they teach the basic logic of proof the basic critical thinking the basic logic of geometry and proving and proofs when you actually had to write down the postulates and write down the theorems and write down the what's and why's of how you got from point A to point B to B from B to C and C to D and D to E Etc. 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 You know the basic steps of solving the problem. They teach you. I mean, they certainly teach the basic steps of solving a problem, especially with quadratic equations and all the other stuff. But they don't teach the kids. And I'm seeing this mostly with my oldest uh, as he comes home with his, you know, geometry and algebra and algebra two and all the stuff that he's doing. Uh, my younger one's not into it yet, but they. They teach you the process to solve the problem, but they don't teach you the steps of the the procedural steps to solve the problem of, you know, when you go from, you know, what principle you're using to go from A to B and what principle then you employ to go, you know, the substitution principle or the, uh, the transitive properties or, you know, what, what property it is that you're using. Um, so you don't sit down and think of, why you're doing this to this and and it it leads to the notion that you could just do whatever uh you know trans you could just use the transitive property whenever but the transitive property only works in certain situations and that's one of the things that euclid codified in his elements that's one of the things uh in in the later books of when things work and when things don't when you can use this property, when you can't use that property, when you can employ this strategy, and when you can't employ the, the other strategy. That's that that's one of the things that all of this uh all of the structure of the uh uh geometry and algebra that was built on his postulates and his theorems leads us to today. And that's why you have a whole lot of people they're going like, you know, wood floats. So if she weighs as much as wood, then she must be a witch. That's like that. <laughs> oh yeah, I know that's a line from from Monty Python, but that's the same damn logic that people use today. That you know, uh, a virus is this small. So you know, if the hole in the mask is this big, then obviously a mask doesn't work. Well, that's. <laughs> that's not the that's not that's not how this shit works. The viruses aren't just floating around in the air by themselves. They're attached to particles, which are large. Yeah. Okay, we're not gonna get it. <sighs> Vanessa. Given axioms and beyond, how do we teach arithmetic and why and when and how oh goodness. I haven't since Friday night when we had our show with uh, the Kilbro King uh, Kimbros. I 
hung out with my family on Sunday, talked a lot on Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, today's Wednesday. I haven't had a conversation with another human being that's lasted longer than 15 minutes in the last three days. My voice is giving out. Bear with me. <sighs> I've, talked to, I've talked to a lot of people today. Today was a very, 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 very busy day. Uh, but yesterday I was in the distillery distilling, and I don't think I said anything. I think the longest conversation I had yesterday was when I went to Wendy's and ordered lunch. I think that's true. I think that's a factual statement. I think. May not be, but I think it is. Uh, anyway. That's why my voice cracks every once in a while during tonight's show. Um, <laughs> Tara's in the house. Welcome, Tara. Um, why and when and how we teach algebra, et cetera, are all critically important to each student's learning and knowledge and growth. Yeah, I agree. I am uh, I'm less of the... I'm more of the old school variety of teaching where you just like write it on a two by four and you beat it into their heads, you know? My my lovely wife is an actual educator. You're obviously an actual educator. And I know that learning styles have to be matched to teaching styles. You know, you're not just going to, you know, every, you know, kids aren't monoliths. You don't just like, you can't pound it into their heads. But I, I mean, I guess, I guess that means I'm a, I'm a traditional learner because I learned my math. I learned my uh, multiplication with uh, multiplication tables wrote memorization, just doing it again and 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 again until you figured it out. You know, when you're, you know, six years old, you don't need to know why six times two equals 12. You just need to know that six times two equals 12. And I get it. It's different now than it was back then, but but I'll tell you this much. When my, during the pandemic, when I had to teach my nine-year-old, well, he was eight, seven at the time, eight, 2020, he would have been eight. Yeah, whatever. When I had to teach that kid to do stuff and he got the shit wrong and I made him do push-ups, or I made him run laps or I made him do jumping jacks, he got that shit right. <laughs> it didn't take him too many missed opportunities to, to, to learn, God, what was it? The uh, conjugated verbs or something like that. Like if he missed a conjugated verb, he had to give me ten jumping jacks. Missed a conjugated verb, ten more jumping jacks. Missed a conjugate, ten more jumping jacks. He learned that shit fast. <laughs> he did not like doing the jumping jacks. Um, and there was another time. Uh, uh, this was an afternoon class. One of the classes that we were doing in the afternoon. I don't remember what it was. I think it was. It was either. It was history or language spelling or whatever it was I can't, I can't remember what it was he had a glass of orange or apple juice that he was sipping on and i had a glass of whiskey that i was sipping on and i'm like let's go walk and we go walk around and we're talking about the the lesson and understanding the lesson and and i take a sip and he takes a sip and i take a sip and he says do you need a refill so i need to give him some more apple juice uh, you know not not exactly a sit down and learn type of family we we were walk around and talk type of family but <laughs> you know, learning styles. I get it. I can adapt learning teaching styles to learning styles too. I was a very uh a very uh uh strong armed professor uh <laughs> during the pandemic. Um the bike is figured oh wait, what? Where are we at? Uh I got pics of my bike today. Ooh. Are you hitting more tree than the Tara got in a, okay. The, uh, Tara, Tara, <laughs> you, Tara, <laughs> what are you doing running your bike into a tree? Or it sounds like it ran you into the tree. Um, <laughs> goodness gracious. I hope you're okay. Uh, well, I mean, from the sounds of it, it sounds like you're okay. Um, post-op? Post what'd you have to get? 
You got to come by the distillery on Friday if you're in town. I, I want to know all the details. Goodness, I'm glad you're okay. Welcome back to the world of living. Um, uh, but yes, Vanessa, I agree with you. I think this stuff, I mean, not only is this stuff like the language of the cosmos, the language of the universe, but it's basic, logical, critical thinking skills. And it's not, this stuff isn't intuitive. Necess Hang on, let me rephrase this. Let me think about what I'm trying to say here. The logical, procedural uh, progression of learning and developing tools for organizing the world around us, you know, building these uh, uh, algorithms in our heads so that we can, like, understand the information coming at, them, coming at us. That's intuitive. We've been doing that since we were able to stand upright and peer out over the grass. We see information coming in, and we need to be able to process what's dangerous and what's not. We've been doing this forever. Understanding why and how and what we do is important. It's extremely important because information's coming at us faster and faster and faster and faster. And just having the basic critical thinking skills of being able to say, we start with A, and then because A, or because of principle X, we can go from A to B. And then principle S allows us to go from B to C. And then principle M allows us to go from C to D. And once we're at D, we can see that now principle X can apply to D and bring us to E, which is what we were looking to do anyway. Uh, or there's, there's ways to simplify problems and make them into compact little pieces and we can manipulate the little pieces and expand it out. And, and, it, and it, 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 it's, it's a way to logically organize the world around us in conjunction with reality, not just organizing the world around us in a way that we wish it was. You know, we can't create matter we can't make matter disappear. We can't, we can't just wave our hands and turn a, a, a horse into a, a pile of rocks like they can in fucking Harry Potter or whatever. You can't just you can't just just wish things to be and make them happen. You can't just have dead guys from the 1980s rise up and be alive again in a parade in, in, in Dallas so that they can be vice president. And then, oh, he didn't show up here. He's going to show up there. He's going to show up there. He's going to show up. You can't, you can't just do that. The, like, like the world works in a logical, organized, sensible manner. And you can't just wish, you know, the distance between Johannesburg and Perth, Australia was some other distance when it's basically the same distance as Houston to Algiers. You can't just have it be that way. You can't have Houston and Algiers be the same distance to each other and Perth and Johannesburg be the same distance to each other, but yet the earth is a flat pancake. You can't, like, logically speaking, this stuff doesn't work because we don't live in a magical world where things just are whatever you want them to be when you wave your damn hands because you can't connect logically A to B to C to D. You just connect A to B and then you connect C and D and then you decide that B and C don't connect to each other and it doesn't really matter because who cares because what a Harry Potter or whatever dumb crap. And I don't mean to shit on Harry Potter. It's a really charming set of movies. I haven't read the book. But you know, Hermione's really the star of the show. It's really, 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 really important, really, really critical that people understand critical thinking skills and that while it's intuitive to put this stuff together, it's not natural to necessarily be able to explain it. Common sense may be common, 
but it's not always sense and it's not always right. I mean, for for millennia, we thought that animals just appeared. Just the dead meat invented flies. We thought we as a people thought that dead meat invented flies. Like you, you have a dead buffalo, and out of that buffalo, just flies appeared because buffalo had flies inside them. Are you fucking kidding me? For years we th we thought this for generations, for centuries, for millennia, until somebody finally said, "Well, what if we put a what if we put a glass dome over this meat and don't let flies get to the meat? Will it just generate flies?" Lo and behold, <laughs> it didn't. They covered up the meat and it didn't make flies. Go figure, shocker. I know. And we look at that and we're like, well, they're fucking stupid, of course. Duh. But then you have people running around going, oh, they're eating babies. They're taking, this is the latest, they're taking babies and putting them in, 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 in power plants to, to use them to generate electricity. Are you fucking kidding me? People are mostly water. You can't cook a body and make electricity. Are you insane? Jesus. The failure of critical thinking skills. The failure of the ability to people to logically assemble thoughts in a, in a, in a sensible manner. <sighs> An eternal golden braid. Uh, I was able to put on pants. That okay, hang on. I gotta scroll back up. I hit a tree on my uh Harley Fat Boy. Does zero to sixty in three seconds. I don't remember much beyond blinding paint. Yeah, I can imagine that. Uh did a good job laying it down though. Leg ripped out. Oh god. I laid down my motorcycle one time. And it was it was a couple of weeks of agony. I scratched up my hand, uh, which was bad because I was a car salesman. Everybody wanted to shake my hand. I had to walk around like Bob Dole with a, a sharpened pencil in my hand so nobody would want to shake my hand. Uh, <laughs> it was, yeah. But I was okay. I mean, I was. I didn't like hit anything. I just laid it down on, on Memorial Park, Memorial Drive, rather. And I go into Kroger's bleeding, literally dripping blood, looking for gauze. And <laughs> I'm dripping blood off my hand. And I'm, I like have a, an armful of like band-aids and gauze and uh, uh, Bactine and uh, <laughs> just all kinds of uh, just supplies, you know, to stanch the bleeding and. Yeah, it, I'm sure it was a sight to see, a sight to behold. Um, I have not read the book Godel, Escher, and Bach. I have not read that book. Uh, I am currently reading uh, The Velocity of Information written by our very own Safety Doc. Uh, and he will be on the show in a couple of weeks because the, the format I want for this show to be uh, is where we talk about uh, philosophy and science and big ideas. Uh, that's where I'm moving with this show. That's why I'm talking about the Greeks, the Greek thinkers, the the philosopher, mathematician guys, or philosopher, scientist guys from classical Greek, classical, uh, there aren't a whole lot from classical Rome, uh, classical Greek, uh, the Arabic world, Chinese, China, uh, the, you know, the big thinkers, the big, the big stuff. And Safety Doc falls into that category because he's, he's as much a uh, futurist and uh, systems guy as anybody else. And it's going to be fun talking with him because we, uh, the, the, the topics and stuff that he gets into are just, are just fun to talk to. Uh, children are not taught in a way that prepares them for the real world. They don't have a realistic concept of reality. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, I mean, the best, the most realistic concept of reality you're going to get is from experience. Uh, but you can't teach that. You have to teach the principles of you have to teach the theory 
And then as you grow up and experience things, apply the theory. Um, unfortunately, there's a whole lot of people out there who just dismiss the theory, uh, who just hand wave it and go, nah, that's not important anymore. You know, and uh, part of it is from corruption. But, you know, I was talking to my son today about, uh, you know, he's in AP World History class. We're talking about the world history. The history that we were taught when we were kids is was much simpler, much more uh, one-dimensional, maybe two-dimensional. You know, when you start talking about world history, uh, you talk about the lineage. Basically, the, the world history we were taught was the lineage of the United States. Greek, Roman, uh, Greek, Roman, uh, medieval Western Europe, which includes France, but only briefly, then France and England, England, then United States. That's the lineage of world history. World history, as, as when I was in high school, world history when I was in high school, started and stopped basically at the Black Sea and made its way over to the Pacific Ocean. That was world history. Africa only existed in connection with the slave trade, uh, and it, it didn't exist prior to, I guess, the 13, 1400s, 1400s, yeah. Uh, it didn't exist uh, south of the Sahara. It you know it was there, but it wasn't part of history. Uh, China only existed in context of Marco Polo. That was it? That's that was the the world history. And then you moved into uh, modern world history, with, which was literally World War II uh, and other stuff. That was, uh, but we got a whole year of Texas history. <laughs> we got a whole damn year of Texas history. Uh, but you teach the theory. I don't know where I was going with that. I, I got sidetracked. Uh, you teach the theory, and then they apply the theory. And, uh, you know, when when I was in school, I can't speak to anybody. I don't know when everybody else was in. I don't know what you, I barely know what I learned. Uh, when I was in school, we learned the theory. This was before we had to take three different nationalized, standardized tests. Uh, but we learned the theory, and we applied the theory. And we still had to take one, we had to take one standardized test, but we, it was a state test, not a national test. And there wasn't like, you didn't have to take it every year. And it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, or I, it would, maybe it was a big deal. I don't know. I didn't never thought it was that big of a deal, but, um, you learn the theory and then you apply the theory. Uh, you learn the concept and then you applied the concept. Um, you know, and like I said, I never really needed to know why six times two equal twelve. I just need to know that six times two equal twelve. Until I got into the uh, you know late middle school, early high school, then sometimes I needed to know why, but I didn't know, I didn't really need to know why until I got into college. Kids these days, kids these days, kids these days, <laughs> they're learning the why. They're learning. They're learning concepts in math that I, in middle school, that I didn't learn until late in high school. They're literally learning how to do quadratic equations in middle school without being told it's quadratic equations. That's fucking awesome. They're literally learning how when you take... Um, uh, Double digit numbers like 25 times 40, they're literally being shown how to break those apart. Four times 10 times two times 10 uh, plus five times one, or two times 10 plus five times one times four times 10. They're computing all of that out on paper. <clears throat> which is literally the same thing as doing a quadratic equation when you're in 10th grade or 9th grade, whatever they do quadratic equation. I don't remember. <clears throat> and that's, how, but that's how they do the math now. They do the math. When, when I was a kid, we did the math, you know, 25, 40, four times two times five, add the zero. Nah, 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 nah. That's it. That's how you did it. Uh, which is what? A thousand. Four times 25 is 100 plus zero is 1,000. Yeah. They're doing it drastically different now. They're learning the concepts 
or they're learning the principles of the concepts that are going to have to merge in. I guess that's the new math. And that's why parents had such trouble teaching their kids math two years ago during the pandemic, because that's not how we learned it. We didn't learn it like that. We we learned it like with a baton and it written, you know, just getting just beaten into us. Do it again. 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 That's how we learn to do this shit. They're not learning how to do this shit this way. They're learning how to use high level math tools. And whew, it's pretty fucking awesome. I don't know if that means they're necessarily going to be able to know how to do the math, but when all this stuff clicks together in two or three years, well, for my for my youngest, it's clicking together now. It went from he's eleven this year. So it went from fourth grade, fifth grade, he's in fifth now, sixth grade next year. It's all clicking together now. He's already getting this shit clicking together. He's already understanding how to do high school math. That's awesome. That's absolutely awesome. What he doesn't understand yet, because he's not there yet, you know, he's still two years away from doing the geometric proofs, the Euclidean proofs, the actual geometric, logical progression of understanding how to think. And I don't remember if my oldest son did that in the same way. I don't remember seeing him actually writing out the proofs, but his eighth grade year or his seventh grade year, when what? No, his eighth grade year was pandemic year. So I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. He might have skipped that. Um, ah, okay. So they're learning it at a much earlier age now. I got you. That makes sense. Um, Um, oh, okay. Post a video of my 19 year old son cooking me chicken paprikash, chicken pap. Chicken paprikash. Did I pronounce that right? Chicken paprikash? I feel like I pronounced that right. Uh, for lunch today, he's taking care of me very proud. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, well, you know what? Most kids never have actual jobs in their 20s. Yeah, that's entirely fair. But you know what's even more shocking? The concept of kids having a childhood is relatively modern. Within my parents' lifespan, prior to 1950, the whole concept of teenagers didn't exist prior to 1950. What happened before 1950? World War II. What happened before World War II? The 1930s, the Great Depression. What happened before the Great Depression? The 1920s. The Roaring Twenties. Child labor laws weren't put into effect until World War II, the 1940s. But if you were 18, hell, if you were 17, you were going to fight in Germany or Japan. The concept of a of kids going on dates, of of high school kids sock hops going on dates uh, did not exist prior to the 1940s going to college as a as an expected um, as an expected outcome of, of of youth didn't exist until the 1960s just just you know you you, you go to you go to high school and then you go get a job but but like college being a natural natural extension of your education didn't exist until the 60s with the uh 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 GI bills and uh the expansion of the middle class and all this other stuff that happened that just did not exist prior to the 1950s 
prior to the 1960s, college for just a, as a standard expectation for kids did not exist. And even in the 60s, it wasn't like everybody's going to college. Like not everybody was going to college in the 1960s. Uh, not not everybody was going to college in the 1970s. It w- really wasn't until probably the late 80s when it was ex- almost expected that most of the kids would be going to college. Probably. That's something. That's that's some data that I would like to dig into. There was a huge cultural shift, especially in the United States, uh, and you see it in the music too. Uh, in the 1970s was the first time you had 19-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 16, 17, 18, 19-year-olds making music for 16, 17, 18, 19-year-old kids. The first time ever. Prior to the 1960s, music was made by older people for younger people because youth culture didn't exist. But that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. Um, in fact, I may talk to Safety Doc about that because one of the topics that Safety Doc goes back to frequently is the decline of institutions and institutions that were created, invented, and thrived in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s do not thrive any longer. They're struggling very, very, very badly now. Churches, Rotary, uh, churches, Rotary, BFW, uh, Mason Lodges, all that stuff, bowling leagues, all those things struggle today uh, compared to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Ah, but that's something else to, uh, that's something else to discuss, probably with safety talk. Um, yeah. I know a lot of folks uh, that, you know, I mean, they, they say that. I mean, even folks out here, uh, you know, suburban Houston, they they would say the same thing like they were they were they they weren't poor but they had to mind their pennies they had to they had to watch their cash but but also if you, if you think about it when we were kids a lot of the stuff that we knew a lot of stuff that we take for granted today like long distance phone calls cable that stuff was expensive or did not exist uh and I think cable is probably about the same today as it was then, but it's a smaller percentage of our take-home income, and you get a whole lot more for it. But long-distance phone calls? We used to have to pay money to call people in Louisiana. I used to have to ask my dad if it was okay to make a long-distance phone call. How fucking weird is that? Like, I had to, I had to ask permission to call Dallas or Arkansas. Or 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 Natchitoches, Louisiana, because that was a long distance call, and that cost money to call somebody on the other side of Texas. That's weird. Like we don't have to do that shit now. You can pick up the phone and call somebody in in Memphis for nothing, or Tacoma, or Paris, or wherever. Long distance calls, like people don't have a concept that long distance calls used to. That, that long distance calls even exist. You know, you see a, a area code that's 214, you're like, okay, or 356, or you know, whatever. And it's like, okay, whatever. No big deal. Like, they just, that's just a phone number now. It's insane. It, it, it is mind boggling. Um, yeah, I remember work, my first job, I was, uh, I think I was 16 for my first job, but prior to that, I was probably mowing. mowing I, I certainly mowed my own lawn. Um, drainage ditches for neighbors. Holy shit! Yeah, you just go work. You, I mean, that, I mean that, that's what we did. We didn't we didn't have the stuff. We didn't have the distractions uh, then. You know, you had nothing else to do. Like, what am I going to do all day long during the summer? Uh, read. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you think I am a nerd? Uh, <laughs> actually, I kind of am. Um, but yeah, you just worked. Um, that is true. Not everyone can go to college. That is that that's 
everyone's expected to go to college, but not everyone can go to college. And it's created this, uh, this, that's a very deep conversation for another day. In fact, I think I talked about it once, uh, talked about, uh, not yeah, I talked about it in a day in the life with the, the student loans and the, the, the economy that was built around what ended up being student loans and why the, why the student loans issue is a problem. Uh, we should probably dig into that some other day, not today. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about that today. But I will say this: it's. Yeah, we'll talk about student loans another day. I don't want to talk, talk about that right now. Party lines and rotary phones. Dial five for a local call. Yeah. <laughs> I knew somebody whose phone number was ten. Their phone number was ten. 10. Yeah. I didn't know. I, I, I never called them. This was, I knew somebody who told me their phone number growing up was 10. That's how small of a town they lived in. If you wanted to call somebody in the next town, you had to dial five numbers. But if you wanted to call somebody in that town, you only had to dial two. That's how few people lived in their town. Obviously less than 100. But yeah, I mean, the whole concept of switchboard operators and uh, uh, that's completely foreign to people today. Uh, switchboard operators, uh, switchboard operators, uh, elevator operators, you know, automatic elevators put people out of business, put people out of work. Uh, switch, uh, automated switchboards put people out of work. There used to be physically rooms full of people connecting phone calls from one point to another and they could listen in on your phone call but that doesn't happen anymore coin operated payphone yeah i remember those too i remember those um picking up the phone and hearing the neighbors yeah that's i mean that's how it was you know there would be a, a phone in the town that was at the store and if you wanted to make a phone call, you had to go down to the drugstore and make a phone call because that was the only damn phone in the whole damn town. Um, and then, you know, the phone started spreading out. Well, the first guy to buy a phone didn't have anybody to call. Huh. Just like the first guy who went to buy pants went into the store not wearing pants. Huh. Something to think about. First person to buy pants went into the store to buy pants without wearing pants because he had to buy pants. Think about that one, kids. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of people that start college and don't finish college. That is also true. Um, but it's also expected for high school students to go to college. There's an expectation. Uh, that, that, that that's the pipeline. That's the intent. Go into high school with the intention of graduating and going to college. And granted, not everybody's cut out for college, but we live in a world and an economy that is best suited to having college-educated people operating everything that needs to be operated. Um, and there's no shame in not finishing college. There's plenty of good lives to be led for people who don't finish college. Uh, there's plenty of jobs that don't require college degrees. Um, and they're great jobs too. But the best jobs, generally speaking, are reserved for the people who have completed college and generally have gone on to get higher level degrees. Um, and, and it's, it's, it, it, it's not best jobs as a qualitative statement necessarily because each individual, I mean, I could not fathom being a teacher, but my lovely wife is a great teacher and she loves being a teacher. She could not fathom doing what I do for 12 hours at the distillery when I'm, when I'm distilling liquor. It's not, my job to her is not ideal and her job to me is not ideal. So, you know, that's, that's the individual qualitative statement is not the best. 
the the best is not intended to be an individual column. The best is in best, better, good is intended to be a uh, uh, a societal qualification where where we want people we want to create people who are engineers and CAD drafters and coders and uh, uh, robotics analysts and and we want to create train people to do these types of jobs and our and then we want to import people to do the other jobs. We don't want to create, we don't want to educate a uh, workforce full of people who are picking strawberries. We want to educate a workforce of people who are robotics engineers and astrophysicists and you know higher level like you know that that's as as a, as a policy goal that's what we're shooting for that's what we as a country are shooting to do we don't want to we don't want to create you know there's a uh, five million kids being uh, graduated every year we don't want five million plumbers we don't need five million plumbers every year we need doctors and lawyers and astrophysicists and 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 robotics engineers and material uh, engineers and metallurgists and we need those people in our economy to keep things moving on the advanced uh, cutting edge of growth and development. Uh, so that makes sense that everything our education system is is built to assume that people the kids graduating high school are going to then go to college and then like the default should be going to college and then if you don't make it there then you trickle down into the other that that's not even a good way of saying it so you're not really trickling down you're deviating onto a different path you like this is where we want you to go we want you to be an astrophysicist okay well if you're not going to be an astrophysicist maybe consider being a mechanic or uh uh, you know, we need diesel engineers. We need, uh, you know, whatever. Okay, if you're not going to do that, how about another technical, you know, whatever. Uh, you'll, you'll deviate onto the other paths. It's not a better or lesser. It's, this is where we want people. And if you can't be here, well, what about here? Or what about here? And what about here? And each different slice should be smaller. They don't teach people in high school to be business owners. They don't teach us to be entrepreneurs. They don't teach us to be uh uh, uh, individual, uh, individual, individuals who aren't a part of the workforce. Their goal, the policy goal of of school districts, schools, colleges, is to get people into the workforce. The workforce being people who work for other people, take W twos and and have a paycheck and 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 work for corporations and and small business owners. They don't teach people to go to school and become a small business owner. That is a different career track. Uh, and a lot of people end up going to school, then they go to college, and it's like, this isn't really right for me, but okay. And then they go into a career, and then they just like nope out and go off over here and become a business owner, like some people I know. It's, um, but that's as, as, a, as a society, as a government, our policy goal should be to have people go to school and then go to college and then, you know, become, you know, the, the scientists and teachers and, and, uh, uh, business managers and accountants and whatever value add paper pushers that people become. That's the goal. That's the intent. That's what they, that's what, that, that's how everything is designed to be. Uh, and then you take, uh, you know, 90% of the kids and put them in college and 60% of them make it in college, 30% of them wash out. And then of those 30%, okay, now let's put you into trades or whatever else and join the other 5% that didn't go to college in the first place. That's <clears throat> that's kind of how it goes. Um, it did college after, a lot of people did college after they, they retired from the military. Military pays for it, or, or at least a good chunk of it. Uh, that's how my dad did it. He went to military. He went to the military in order to pay for college. Um, <laughs> ask those online. The neighbors could just stay online and listen. Yeah, that's 
the, the, the old party line phones. That's how it was. Um, coin operated pay phones. <laughs> I remember going to the uh, Capitol in Indianapolis, Indiana State Capitol in Indianapolis, and seeing a bank of coin operated phones. I took a picture of one and sent it back to my wife so she could show the kids. You don't see those things every day. Um, that's exactly right, Tara. You had a phone in the hallway and it had a cord and the cord was like 90 feet long. So you can go anywhere in the house, uh, but definitely around the corner into the bathroom. So you can sit in the bathroom and talk in private. That is how we did it. You had one phone or two. You had one downstairs, one upstairs. If you had an upstairs, otherwise you just had one phone in the hallway downstairs. Uh, mine was in the kitchen. Um, ours was on the, on the wall in the kitchen. There was the kitchen. There was the dining room and the wall in between. That's where the phone was. And around the corner was the bathroom. That's, you know, the, the phone cord was 15 feet long. So we could go into the bathroom and let's talk in the bathroom. Um, uh, <laughs> never allowed to touch the phone unless it was an emergency. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you. I think everyone should go to college, at least junior college, at least try it. Um, but it's not, it's it's uh, it really isn't for everyone. Um, but the the recent phenomenon, the relatively recent phenomenon, in the last five years of elevating trades above, uh, elevating the idea of How do I want to phrase this? Elevating the notion of having a trade above the notion of pursuing college intrinsically has been bizarre and very curious to me because we certainly need plumbers, we need pipe fitters, we need welders, and we need. But I was in the, I was literally sitting in a room with a young lady who is very dear to my heart, who is a theater major, who is going to school to be a theater major, and her boyfriend, who is also going to school to be a theater major, and his family didn't have as much money as, her, as hers. And he was going to have to work damn hard to pay for college. And this was a second-tier state school Cheaper than your your average school. Great theater program. Uh, and I and I, and I listened to somebody who would generally respect their opinion and generally respect their intellect. Tell this kid who was going who wanted to be a theater major that maybe he should consider going to a trade school and maybe becoming a plumber or an electrician or a welder, because those people make a lot of really good money. And it was just, it was so surreal to listen to somebody tell a kid, an 18-year-old kid, 17, 18-year-old kid, who was looking to go to school to be a theater major, to pursue his career goals as a theater major, that maybe you want to be a welder. Like, that kid doesn't want to be a welder. There's not a scenario where that kid is going to wake up in the morning and go, you know what, I think I'm going to weld. And I get it. We don't always get to be what we want to be when we grow up. You know, when you're nine and you want to be an astronaut, you end up when you're 30 and you're looking around and going, oh, I'm not going to be an astronaut anymore. Not everybody gets to be what they want to be when they grow up. But you don't tell a fucking 17-year-old kid Maybe you should be a welder. I mean, you're not built for being a welder. You're not interested in being a welder. You're not inclined to be a welder in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, maybe you should be a welder. And, you know, sometimes you just need that Simon Cowell type of thing to tell a, a shitty singer that, you know, you should continue waiting tables. But this kid should at least try. You should at least strive. You should at least aim high and 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 try to achieve your goals. Um, 
I mean, he shouldn't, you know, you should never, ever, 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 ever go deep into debt to pay for college. Uh, especially if you're going to be a theater manager. <laughs> but you should certainly work and try to to pull it off. You should, you know, get your grants and you should get you, you should get it paid for. Figure out how to do it. And and aim high. I mean, worst case scenario, you miss what you, you miss your mark and you drift off and die among the stars, which sounds lonely and sad, but I mean, you get to be among the stars. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, you know, you, you you flail around and fail, but you know, you, when you have your whole future in front of you, and you have your whole opportunity of of the literally the world is your oyster, and you can be and do anything you want to be and do, go for it. Fucking aim high and do it. Try, at the very least, try. But to tell a kid who's I mean, that's like telling a married couple or a, a couple on their wedding day, like, congratulations, but you know half the marriages fail. I'm like, fuck you, man. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you bringing rain into my uh, sunshine party for, dude? Good God. And, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes that's the kind of reality check the kids need. Like, dude, you're going to, you're taking a hard path. You're going to, you're going to have troubles. But, you know. Gold is forged in fire. That's how we purify the uh, elements. You 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 go through tr struggles and troubles and and you work and you fight and you 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 ball up your fist and you swing and you swing and you swing and you swing until you can't swing anymore. And then, only then, do you finally throw up your hands and go, "I can't do this anymore. Got to stop." That's how you start a business. That's how you uh, uh, that's how you get make your way through. Uh, the hard classes, because there's going to be hard classes, statistics and calculus and fucking Roman literature or whatever other crap they have to go through nowadays. My crucible classes were finance and statistics. Those were my crucible classes. Uh, economics was easy and, you know, the other math, marketing and all the other shit was easy. But statistics, goddamn, everybody has their crucibles that they have to go through. But, you know, you, you don't want to cheat people out of those. Those are important. That's, that's important. That, those are character-forming, formidable things. Uh, and, you know, Tara, that's a, that's a hell of a point. Uh, when, I, when I was in high school, they had technical classes that they taught kids. Wood shop and uh, auto shop. And uh, they had these technical classes. They gave kids a basis a baseline basis that where they could go from there to the next thing. I don't know if they have those classes. anymore. Uh, I, I, I see over here on my, on my uh, side table, there's a, some kind of a, I don't even know what the fuck that is. Some kind of clay abomination that my oldest son made. It looks like a top hat, but it's very small. And instead of being open at the bottom, it's open at the top. So I guess it's a pen holder. I'll show it to you all one day. It is, it is ugly. It is large, and it is useless. He was going to throw it away, but I was like, "Don't throw it away. Let me throw it away." <laughs> it's too big to be a pen holder. It's too bulky to be a desktop thing. It's it's giant. Anyway, I'll show it to y'all one day. Not today. Um, but yeah, I don't know if they still have wood shop and metal shop and the shop class. I don't know if they still have those. They should, but I don't know if they still do. But you know what they've been replaced with? Coding, robotics, uh, astronomy labs. Uh, they've been replaced with sciences and higher, higher level classes. Uh, which granted, that means the kids who are inclined to be ditch diggers, wood shop, mech, uh, mechanical, uh, you know, they're like, I'm not even gonna, oh, I'm not gonna be a chemist. I just wanna, wanna make engines run. You know, we all knew those kids. I knew those kids when I was in college or high school. I knew those kids. Uh, black jeans, 
t-shirts. We knew those fucking kids. Um, there's not a place for them. There's not a there's not an a a, a a path, a class. But maybe they show an aptitude for other mechanical engineering things. Maybe they show an aptitude not for building engines, but for building robots. Maybe they show an aptitude not for building, um, not for designing uh, uh, fuel pumps and uh, uh, fluids uh, uh, pathways, circulatory pathways for fluids and engines, but maybe coding pathways for uh, electricity and data. I mean, you know, there's different ways to apply the same knowledge. Um, But that's the type of stuff. Undergrad degree in 2000. I got my undergrad. And we're about the same age. I got my undergrad degree in 98. So, yeah. Um, but that's the kind of... But that's the kind of logical progression that if you teach kids how to logically think and how to logically maneuver and logically progress from A to B to C to D to E to F, et cetera, et cetera, they can, they can see what they like to do. Kids will, will move towards things that they see and things that they have access to. And if you aim, if you take their chins and you lift them up so that their line of sight is higher, they will aim higher because they will see higher. But if you get them to aim higher, you also have to give them to tools, the tools to think higher and stronger and better and continue this basic Socratic and Platonic logical progression from given axioms all the way through to logical conclusions. Because you cannot design a circulatory system for an engine. You cannot design an electrical, co uh, uh, electrical circuit. You cannot design basic code for a robotics uh, uh, mission or a robots, robotic system. You cannot design a mechanical uh, uh, amalgamation of machines if you cannot understand that basic logic flows in a certain way. And if you can't say, I'm going to do B because of this principle or because of this theorem or because of this logical connection between A and B, then you're not going to be able to successfully do a goddamn thing because what's going to end up happening is you're going to say, oh, well, the fluid is pumping out all over the floor. So it must be fucking aliens or whatever dumb shit you leap your dumb conclusions to because you don't know how to think. Basic thinking skill. Basic axiomatic principles. Axiomatic logic. Basic proofs. Basic logical progression to be able to express our knowledge and to be able to explain common sense because otherwise if you can't explain your common sense and have a logical proof then you look at a woman and you say well if she weighs more than a duck she must be a witch or if she weighs the same amount of a duck she must be a witch and then you burn her because you know ducks float so if she floats she must weigh the same as a duck and witches float because, you know, they burn or whatever. I don't know. Go watch Monty Python. It's a good movie. All the Monty Python movies are great movies. Um, got me to enlist. One of my friends never came back. Well, what? Delayed enlistment. One friend never came back. One retired to divorce. And a lot of issues. I crawled back. Well, bravo, Tara. Tara. Um, the goddamn bacon's in the house. The man with the amazing mustache. <laughs> that is a marvelous mustache, I must say. Welcome to the party, Bacon. You're at the tail end of the party. 
Four out of six siblings left for military. Three of us retired military. Well, good for you, Vanessa. That is awesome. Actually, my generation in my family is the first generation, my generation of my branch of the family. Actually, my generation of this of my family is the first generation to not have universal enlistment. Uh, no, I take that back. My dad enlisted. My uncle did not. Uh, the dad, uncle, uncle OD, I had one out of three uncles. My dad and two uncles, one out of three enlisted. On, on the other side, I had an uncle enlist, the only uncle enlisted on my mom's side. So about half of my parents' generation enlisted. Uh, of my generation, less than 10%. It was very, very, very few. But uh, we're also talking a different era, you know, from the kids born in the 40s, the boomers, to the uh, late, bo Jesus, was it late boomers, late stage boomers, early stage Xers. There was a lot of overlap there because my parents were, my parents were the last of their generation. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of their older siblings had kids. My oldest cousin is the same age as my mom. That's 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 the spread of the generation there. So my my cousin's youngest aunt is the same age as them. That's anyway. Um <clears throat> boomers. You're not a boomer, Vanessa. Sorry. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> You got your undergrad in 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 two thousand. Unless you started late, uh, unless you started late, you're I'm I'm skeptical because you're not older than I am, and I'm Gen X. I don't think you're older than I am. Yeah, I mean you might be. I'm, I won't take that away from you. If you want to be a boomer, be a boomer. Uh, there's a whole lot of Gen Xers that are that are that act like boomers. So, <laughs> bunch of Bunch of bunch of Xers with spoiled, with spoiled brains that act like boomers. Maybe one of these days I'll do a show where I talk about the uh, multi generational betrayal of baby boomers. Um, you're sixty. Oh, you are older than me. Well, okay, you're older than me in real life. Me, the old humble guy. I'm like two thousand two forty five hundred years old is the age that I claim. Uh, the old humble guy is an eternal celestial being that travels back and forth between the spirit world and the corporeal world, uh, never, never taking his fingers out of the spirit world while continuously dabbling in the corporeal world here with everybody else. But me personally, in real life, yeah, I'm, I'm still in my forties. <laughs> what did I say? Forty six hundred. 4,636. But, you know, once you pass the couple thousand year mark, you really don't count years, individual individual years. It just becomes general ranges. You know, I'm uh, 2,500 years old, something, something like that. Anyway. Um, 16 years in service. Ex born in the 70s. Tara, yeah, you and me are in the same, uh, in the same boat. Um, absolutely. We all, we all remember this. Uh, we'll have to ask Vanessa about, you know, uh, what they eight tracks and, and, and records and stuff like that, that, you know, what life was like before microwave ovens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, it is. According to, oh shit, it's after midnight. We've been doing this for two hours. Guys, it's time to end the show. Uh, it's time for me to go to bed. Uh, I've got an early morning. I'm distilling in the morning. I'm making gin. Uh, so let's wrap this up. Tomorrow is trivia day, trivia night. Uh, we're doing trivia at the distillery at 6.30. Uh, if we don't have a big, a big enough crowd at the distillery, I'll turn on the camera and we will do trivia online as well we'll do trivia online and live you will have a chance to win the same prizes that everybody in the distillery has a chance to win uh how we'll do it i don't know i'll figure it out um then we will uh 
<laughs> had an eight track and a Chevelle. Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, my older brother had a Chevette. It was a shitty car. Um, Bachman Turner Overdrive. I remember, okay. The eight track we listened to was in a Pontiac Bonneville, yellow Pontiac Bonneville. And we would, what is this? Oh, um, uh, yellow Pontiac Bonneville. We would listen to it. John Denver's greatest hits eight track between Houston and uh, Natchitoches. And we would listen to that song, but that's that eight track. And my dad was a terrible singer, but he would sing uh, country roads. And to this day, that is one of my fondest memories. Um, country roads, take me home to the place. I belong, West Virginia, Mountain Mama, take me home, Country Roads. Ah, great song. I uh, also had Kermit the Frog, if I'm not mistaken. We had the, we had a Muppets 8-track, uh, uh, Kenny Rogers, and um, uh, Kenny Rogers. The Gambler, uh, and uh, Willie Nelson. You had a Willie Nelson 8-track in that car. Uh, but to this day, if I could get a uh, John Denver tribute artist to perform at the distillery, I, w I think I might die. Uh, that, would be, that would be just fucking amazing. Uh, I didn't finish this one. Okay, it's after 12. You know what? Let's go... 15 more minutes. Bacon just showed up. So we got to keep this going. 15 more minutes for bacon. Um, let's recap the show, shall we? We talked about uh, the Euclidean principles, the postulates, the Euclidean postulates, um, which is a line can be drawn in between any two points. That is the definition of a line. That line can be extended out into infinity, uh, and it maintains the same properties all along the, the line from here to there. And anywhere in between, it maintains the same properties. So if you slope it up or slope it down, it maintains its property. It maintains its slope. It doesn't bend. It doesn't turn. It doesn't move. It doesn't shift. A circle can be drawn between, with a single point and a radius of any size. The circle is a circle using a single point and a radius. And every circle is congruent because it has a radius and a point and a radius and that circle is congruent, so no matter how big the circle is or how small the circle is, they're all similar, they're all congruent. The fourth postulate is all right angles are equal, which also means that any slice of a right angle is equal, and it also means that any triangle made with a right angle, uh, if the sides are equal, then the triangles are, uh, or if, I'm sorry, if the angles are equal, then the triangles are are of similar proportions to each other. It also means that any other object, if the angles are equal, no matter how big or small that object is, they're all congruent. Uh, but it also means that if you draw something on paper and you blow it up to no matter how big you draw, you blow it up in real life, it is also congruent to what you drew on paper. Scale exists. That was the fourth postulate, uh, the third and fourth postulate. The final postulate, the fifth postulate, was the most uh, categorically um, uh, controversial uh, postulate of them all because it's not always true. It says that for any line, uh, and any point, for any line, uh, any line K, and any point P off of that line K, there is only one line M that can go through that point that is parallel to that line. That is 100% true all of the time, unless it's not. And the only times it's not is when you're working with non-Euclidean geometry, like hyperbolic or spherical. When you have spherical geometry, and you can see this on a globe, you have those lines which will be parallel at a point, but then when they go off to the poles, they can come together, and then they cross, and then they move back around, and then they're parallel again. Or you can draw a line that is actually parallel and circumscribe smaller and smaller and smaller circles until you get up to the point. So there you have it. Those are the five Euclidean 
postulates, and all five of those postulates describe the universe in which we live in. It describes the geometry on which we live on, and it describes all of geometry and algebra going forward from there. His postulates, his books, the, uh, the elements, uh, inspired Archimedes, inspired uh, Galileo, inspired uh, Copernicus, inspired Einstein, inspired uh, Maxwell, inspired Gould. Einstein's inspiration was specific, not, well, it wasn't specific too, but included especially that fifth postulate, which says parallel lines do not intersect unless the fabric on which they're on curves or bends, because Einstein then theorized that time and space itself was a fabric. And if time and space itself is a fabric and gravity warps that fabric, then light as it travels through time and space will in fact bend and warp as well, which was the literal foundation of Einstein's relativity theory, which was so advanced that they weren't able to confirm it until after he died. And to this day, they have to uh, continuously uh, adjust the time on uh, uh, geo uh, geostationary orbiting satellites because the time on the satellites continuously moves slower than time on Earth because they are so far away and moving so damn fast. <sighs> also, we want a bronze medal at the Texas Whiskey Festival this year. The Texas Whiskey Festival awarded a bronze medal to our Double Oak Rye, sponsor of today's show. Our Double Oak Rye gets you there. Our Double Oak Rye is a 95% rye whiskey made with, uh, uh, bottled at 90 proof, aged two and a half years with extra staves in the barrels to give it a deeper, darker flavor. A deeper, deeper flavor, darker color. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then, oh, what, 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 what? Stereographic, oh, projections? Oh, maybe. I don't know about that. We'll see. Maybe stereographic projections. We'll, see. we'll discuss that. Maybe, Vanessa. I don't know. Um, rectangular slice pizza reminds me of free lunch at school. Yes, rectangular slice pizza is exactly what we had at school. Then we started talking, after we started talking about Euclid, uh, we started talking about what kids are taught in school today, and we started talking about college admissions and uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> working a trap and a record player. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, scrolling through chat, looking to see what we got. You know, fever, but I have duck out tomorrow. Yes, uh, I like rhomboid geometry, especially. Okay, so here's the thing there's only like, there's really only three types of. I mean, you could get really, 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 really creative, like donut geometry and stuff like that. But there's Euclidean geometry, which is flat planes. And if you talk about uh, square uh, uh, cubes, hexagons, dodecahedrons, any kind of polygon, uh, they've all got flat planes. And they're just flat planes that are oriented to each other in different ways. What you the, the non-Euclidean geometry that really matters is spherical and hyperbolic. Uh, because now you're talking about specific functions on the curves. Uh, you know, donut geometry and stuff like that, that's just a version of spherical geometry, really, or hyperbolic geometry uh, between the two. Um, you you can have planar uh, Euclidean geometry that's twisted, that that so it's not a flat plane, but it's really a like a Mobius strip, but it's really kind of a flat plane because it's still working on a flat plane. Um, but but you know there there's there's different types uh, when you talk about uh, uh, multi-planar polygons, you're really just talking about planes that intersect each other. Um, but yes, rectangular slice pizzas are the best. Uh, Totino's pizzas. Totino's pizzas are the grown-up version of school lunch pizzas. They're large, flat, rectangular pizzas that taste mostly like cardboard, have really thin sauce, but they are 
fucking fabulous. Four for five dollars, and I'll I'll devour one of those every damn time I sit down. Uh, here's the here's the hack for Totino's pizza. Anchovies, yes, anchovies. They're a thing. They're delicious. Anchovies and a lot of red pepper, crushed red pepper. That's what you need on your Totino's pizza. That makes Totino's pizzas, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, not deluxe. Uh, fr uh, ah, premier deluxe. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with deluxe. That's what makes them deluxe pizzas, and they're fucking amazing. Uh, I actually called a pizza place and asked them if they had anchovies, and the dude didn't even know what a fucking anchovy was. Um, I only had anchovies. Uh, I had I had I had had anchovies one time on a pizza. It was a pepperoni pizza with anchovies, and it was fantastic. I'm like, oh my god, this is what anchovies are. They're great. They're amazing. Um, and then I couldn't find them anywhere. I had to go. I had to go to the grocery store, buy a thing of anchovies, and add the anchovies to my pizza. And that's how. That's just messed up. I shouldn't have to make my own pizza when I'm uh, uh, baking an, uh, a Totino's pizza. Anyway, uh, what is the question, Bacon? Topology of a donut is important. The algebra is upon it. Kaylee algebra is. <laughs> uh, all right. Which of my bourbons pairs well with Mama Celeste? I don't know what Mama Celeste is. You have to give me more context. Um, I have a smoked channel cats. Oh, you've smoked channel cats over a uh, pecan and uh, ooh, mm, sounds delicious. No such thing as bad pizza. Uh, <laughs> oh yes, Tara, there is such thing as bad pizza. There is definitely such thing as bad pizza. Um, however, I will also go with the, uh, I'll, I'll go with the, uh, uh, pizzas are like sex axiom where, you know, even if it's a bad pizza, you still get to have pizza. Um, <laughs> although, uh, I, I like the alternative as well, that pizzas are like sex. If you're doing it with a pineapple, you're doing it wrong. So. There's that. <laughs> um, feverish sounds like you may have a bit of an infection on that uh, wound. You might want to, you might want to get that checked out. But I'm not a doctor. Um. um oh, cheap personal sized frozen pizzas. We, I used to devour those pizzas too, because uh, the local grocery store, the H E B, would sell four of them, about that big, uh, about that big, maybe. Uh, personal size pizzas sell four of them with the little uh, cubed up pepperonis on them. Oh, jeez, pop those bad boys in the uh, toaster oven, just uh, 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 devour it. Oh, so good. Uh, which one of my bourbons goes well with that pizza in particular? I would go with. Uh, Special Reserve, maybe? Um, yeah, Special Reserve. Oh, um, no, I'll, I'll take that back. Uh, our sponsor today uh, goes well with everything. Our uh, Old Humble Double Oak Straight Rye. Bronze medal winner from the 2022 Texas Whiskey Festival. Oh, we got to push a button here on the goddamn bacon. What is this? It's one of those cheap personal... Where was it? Uh, <laughs> uh I I clicked a button to allow that through. <sighs> Although I th I'm pretty sure it would have been on the screen anyway, because this is my chat feed, not like anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, it's not the official. Your yeah, whatever doesn't matter. Fuck it, I don't care. Um. What else do we get? What else? What else? What else is there? Oh, uh, so if you're in the Austin area, May not uh, 15th, May 14th, 
if you're in the Austin area, May 14th, uh, the Texas Whiskey Festival is the premier event for Texas whiskeys and tex Texas whiskey distillers. Um, you get a chance to showcase all your stuff, do uh, uh, tastings, interact with the people. Uh, it is a fantastic event, an absolutely fantastic event. Uh, we will be there, and we will the fight that yawn off for like three minutes. Uh, we will be there, and we will be collecting our bronze belt buckle, which is about that big, uh, because we won our bronze belt buckle for our double oak straight rye. This the awards for this particular event are handed out to only three brands. Uh, there's only three winners in this category. There, uh, in in typical, let me let me give you a little insight on uh, uh, typical competitions. There's a gold medal category, a silver medal category, and a bronze medal category. They may have other categories too, uh, double platinum, platinum, you know, stuff like that. Uh, double gold, best distillery, whatever. Uh, depends on the competition. But if you enter a competition, you usually pay an entry fee. It's like 300, 400 bucks, 150 to 400 bucks, depending on the entry fee, depending on the competition. Um, and there's hundreds of entries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entries. When we entered the uh, London International Spirits Competition in 2020, there was, I think, 300 or so total entries. Uh, we got a gold medal for our straight whiskey and a silver medal for our uh, special reserve. Or, I'm sorry, we switched those. Gold medal for the special reserve, silver medal for the uh, straight whiskey. And in the gold medal category, I think 30, excuse me, 30, uh, 30 whiskeys won a gold medal, and we were the highest, we were the only one from the United States. Uh, that won a medal in at that competition. And then the silver medal, we were the highest ranked whiskey in the silver medal category. And there was something like 40 uh, whiskeys that won uh, the silver medal. And then everybody else went to bronze. So that's kind of how it works in these international spirits competitions. So it's an award-winning whiskey, but it's an award-winning whiskey that got a bronze medal. Uh, I don't generally publicize the bronze medals because I'm not particularly proud of them. Although, to be completely fair and honest, most of the people who are shopping for whiskeys don't know the difference. They say, oh, you want an award? Good. I just call it an award-winning whiskey, and it's fine. But in this particular competition, the Texas Whiskey Festival, there are three. One, two, three. First, second, third. And then everybody else can fuck off. <laughs> so in this particular competition, there was like a dozen or so uh, brands, and we were third. Third place out of a dozen or so. Uh, and I am super, super, super proud of that. And I will absolutely walk up to that uh, stage on May 13th and collect my belt buckle. And I'm going to wear it like a goddamn champion. Sure as hell I will. Um, what are we looking at over here on chat? Y'all having fun on chat? I'm letting y'all. I'm just letting y'all run. Uh, <laughs> Personal record achieved. Good job, Bacon. Um, the sun is watching it and slowly going up. Uh, take some Tylenol, rub some dirt on it. You'll be fine, I hope. Um, my clicker is not working. Frozen pizzas from 7 Eleven. Yeesh. Ah. Page is being unresponsive. Wait, let it be responsive. Look at that. Page is being unresponsive. Quit being unresponsive, Page. Um, there it is. Now we're getting it. We're back. Um, yeah, I allowed that comment. I let it go through. No problem. Uh, four inch oven. All right, Tara's gone. Uh, Vanessa, I appreciate you joining us for the night. Uh, Bacon, I appreciate you coming in and popping into the party. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, but it is time to wrap it up. It's 1230. I have an early morning coming in. And it's not, like the whiskey, uh, uh, the gin that we're distilling is not uh, 
does not give a shit how late I was up last night. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to wrap it. Uh, and we're going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to have a piece of chocolate pie and then I'm going to go to bed. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, children of all ages, let me get back to my other screen. Um, we'll do our closing, uh, our closing toast. Um, may the, may the road always rise up to meet your feet and the wind always be at your back and the slope always be downhill. So you may get where you're going that much easier. Cheers and salutations to all of you good folks. Uh, we'll see you next time. I really do appreciate you joining me for uh, tonight's episode. We will, we'll do it again next week. And uh, I don't know if I'll actually be able to clip the part out where I talk about Euclid and post it up in its own little video. I'm going to try to. I did a lot of cussing. I didn't mean to. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the problem with these conversations. I just like talk. So we'll see. Keep an eye out for that. Share it with your friends and blah, 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 blah. Like, share, subscribe, all that shit. I appreciate the support 100%. We're going to have a big old party and everybody be coming down to the distillery and we're all going to have some fun. I love you guys. Y'all are the best. Keep your eyes open for our 500 subscriber special. Uh, Lisa's going to hate it, but it's going to be awesome. Uh, cheers. Oops. <laughs> I just hit the camera. Cheers. And good night. Uh, which button do I need to push to close the, uh, Carl, which button do I need to push to close the...